Alan, Anthony, welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. We're not going to do a, a, a background and info and all that kind of stuff because Al, you've been on before, so I can refer people to that episode. And Anthony, we'll probably people know who you are, who who are listening. So we'll dive into into the kind of the crux of the conversation. So we're get, we're going to have a little chat around injury and the kind of almost like privatization of a particular rehab. But we're going to talk about your ACL injury to start with. And I think one thing that we as coaches want to and ideally can empathize with an athlete going through a, an injury like that. But to get your perspective of the first minutes, hours and days post finding out that you've done your ACL, I think would frame this conversation really nicely. So I'm going to hand over to you, Ant, just to give us your perspective of what that's that's like to sustain an injury like that. Yeah, I think the ACL was um, was definitely a strange one for me um, in particular. You know, the first, well, when it actually happened, um, there's still some debate myself and Al have had over exactly where in the game it happened because there was one instance where I felt my knee a little bit, but it wasn't serious. And then there was a real definitive instance where at that point I said to myself in my head, oh, no, you've done your ACL here. And then <clears throat> I got up from what it was um, and started feeling around it a bit and it felt all right. It didn't feel too bad. So I tried to play on um, and, you know, I jogged to the next line out um, and I remember someone from the sideline shouted, it's not worth it. And at this point I was thinking to myself, it's absolutely not worth it. Um, I think we were getting battered by 60 odd points by Saracens at home. So it definitely wasn't worth it. By the time I just felt like it's, it feels to me like a bit of a coward's way out to go, off the field injured when you're losing so badly. So I really didn't want to come off, but in the end I made the right decision, which was to come off. And um, I guess the few days that, that happened after that, they normally try and keep you two, three days after an injury before you have a scan. So those are probably the worst, worst, you know, hours or days or period between injuries. Cause you don't know what it is. You're hoping for the best. You're, I mean, I will tell you, whenever I pick up any type of niggle, I will be on the blower to absolutely anyone who's got any kind of medical profession <laughs> background and anyone who's sustained any kind of injury within that um, area. So, you know, I spoke to Luke Cowan Dickey. I spoke to um, one of my friends who had done an ACL. I spoke to someone who had done, um, you know, a different type of uh, knee injury as well, just to try and see what theirs felt like, to try and make my own mind up as to what it was and I did that um, and I still had a lot of optimism that it could be something that wasn't my ACL but I think deep down I knew that it wasn't a, a quick turnaround um, and I knew that it was going to be a pretty lengthy spell but I think once the once the scan result came back I was in the car with the physio at the time Mark Beggs who was at Bath and um, oh mate it was pretty pretty rough I'll be honest with you like that it was just like, I don't know, nine months is, especially at that point in the season, like I had just, I'd felt, I was actually training with Al two, three weeks beforehand and I felt like some of the best that I'd ever felt in terms of my career off the back of the Lions tour and so on. So I was in, I felt like I was in great shape and ready to have a, a really good season. So for it to be taken away, literally in, it was the second game I played that season, the first one I was on the bench, so I hadn't really got any minutes and... um yeah, for it to be taken away so quickly was just like a bit of a, a blow. And it's not just, you know, you can't play for nine months. It's, you can't play for Bath. You can't play for England. You can't go on a summer tour. You can't play in the Six Nations. It's like all the things that you'd had planned for the year and um, had really wanted to achieve are now thrown completely out the window. And generally what I tend to do is, oh, what I've had, unfortunately, a lot of experience doing now is... Um, given myself a period to kind of just sulk and and yeah because that's what it is it is it's like a grievance honestly that's what it feels like it's like I've got to get over this at some point but for now I need to to just be on my own you know I don't even want to see Mrs the little one I just want to be on my own because it's dark and um and I feel like yeah they helped me massively getting through it but in that brief period I, I'm the only one who can pick myself up um so I had two days where I literally just sat at home and did nothing, just ate terrible food and watched terrible stuff and was 
resolved of all responsibilities in life. I played a lot of PlayStation. Um, but then I think after that two days, it's time to kind of figure out a plan. You need to, to understand how you can make the best of this entire situation. And um, I knew pretty early on, even probably before I had surgery, that I, I needed hours involvement in this. Um, and it was just a matter of how I was going to do that and how I was going to make it work with the club. And fortunately, there was some um, contextual stuff that happened in terms of my contract and, and stuff like that that made it a lot simpler for Al to basically, in the end, in my opinion, take full reins of my rehab. So Al wasn't at, you weren't at Bath at the time. You'd gone yeah. self-employed. Al. Yeah, I was, I was, I'd been, so what, I'd been away from the club for probably, ooh, a year and a half, maybe, maybe a bit more. Yeah. So, and why did you decide to go private or, or go to Al, who wasn't at the club at the time? How was that seen from a club perspective? And we'll get Al in a second to yeah. kind of give give your side of this, and then we'll dive into the, what that rehab looked like. But from a club perspective, from your perspective, why did you go down the route you went down? Um, I think retrospectively there's so many reasons I could list now as to why I would I did it and why I would never hesitate to do it again like if I had any type of injury now god forbid and we find some wood to touch um that you know would keep me out of playing for anywhere and upwards of like six to eight weeks um, I'm doing it without there's no one else I'll be honest with you because the difference is just ridiculous um but in the short term the reasons why I did it was because I knew that how good I felt after spending periods of time with Al beforehand. Um, he had rehabbed at ACLs before and I knew um, how important it was going to be for me to come back and be able to change direction, fully trust changing direction, not just from a, a feel perspective, but from an understanding of how I'm supposed to move perspective and um, and the same with speed. Um, so I knew how, how important uh, a part that was going to have in my rehab and there was no one better for me um than to have Al be instrumental in that and at the first at first in my head it was more of like a Al's gonna facilitate or help towards you know maybe one day or two days a week or you know towards the end when I start running um and that quickly evolved into pretty much Al was head of S&C head of <laughs> head of medical work <laughs> Anthony Watson basically <laughs> <laughs> So how did the how did the club deal with that? If you don't mind me asking, what was that situation like? I mean, I got in pretty early. I did. I got in pretty early with the, the fact that I was going to have a, a role to play. Um, and then in the end, Mark Beggs uh, Begsy was was really good at just letting me um, letting me and Al take control of it. Um, obviously, there was some difficulties in terms of like how it would work. With um, there was one particular sticking point with uh, Ice OK which I don't want to touch on too much because that machine is the worst machine on planet Earth. Um, but there was just difference of opinions there, which was frustrating from a player's perspective. But I think that that's kind of what you had to... That was the balancing act that we had to get right in order for me to do the rehab that I wanted to do. So <clears throat> there is a bit of, you know, give and take. It wasn't just, you know, everything they say we're, we're throwing out the window. It was like, you know, we need to do this in order to do that. So, you know, we'll... Um, We'll, we'll try and keep all parties happy in this situation and make sure that we're listening and getting their opinion. It's not just my way is the right way and your way is the wrong way. It was very much of a, like, we'll work together um, point of view. And I think that we were lucky um, in that it, we were allowed to do that. Um, but I was pretty adamant and um, demanding, I guess, in, in, the, in Al's involvement because I knew how important it would be to me and Honestly, I'm so, so grateful that I did it. Like it was, uh, you know, up there with some of the, one of the best decisions of my life. It's interesting because we've had, I had a performance on from Crystal Palace a couple of years ago and we were talking about this in reverse. So he was in the club and we were talking about obviously Premier League footballers getting their own staff in. So I'm interested to get Al, your insight into obviously being on the other side. It's slightly different because you've been in the club, so you've got them relationships anyway, but been brought back what was it like rehabbing a player that you weren't actually contracted initially to be looking after? Yeah, it's one of those ones that you, you get asked quite a lot, not just in this podcast, but like by other practitioners in the private sector. Oh, I, I heard you did this. How did you manage it? Because 
I'm finding it out to be just a, a nightmare. It's just so hard. Um, but actually, I think having a player that was very clear with what he wanted to achieve initially was massive. Um, having a head of medical in Mark Beggs who was incredibly open to um, an understanding in that the the one area that Ant had a huge focus on, which was returning back faster and more evasive. Um, the club maybe didn't have expertise in that very particular domain of athletic development and that was something that we could we could help him with and then the other thing and it's kind of like being in a relationship I think like you've just got to be super open and super honest and be like look this is what I can offer I'm not going to try and be somebody else I'm not going to try and uh, come in and try and take over the reins of your program it's not like I'm trying to say your program is poor and mine is amazing it's just here's this small area that I can I think have a, a big influence on and coming to agreements um, before anything is, is actually rolled out to be like, this is how we're going to go about doing it. And, and almost having not a contract or anything as official as that, but having a very clear set of objectives that this is how we're going to go about doing it. And I think with that in hindsight, I've heard some horror stories of, of, of private practitioners going in and, and trying to forge relationships with players or staff or whatever and it not working. I think just the openness and the and the ability to sit around a table or on a or on a joint phone call and go look, this is this is where I can help. What do you think? Where do you see the obstacles and the hurdles being? Can we come at this from all angles to try and contribute to something that's that's the best for the player? And so far, my my professional experience that's been the best way to go about doing it. And and thus far, I've had nothing but massively positive things to say with the players and the clubs that I've worked with and kind of consultancy roles so yeah I think to summarize it it's just being open and being very clear and honest with what you can offer um, and and making people feel at ease that you're not some terrorist coming in to blow up their organization like that's not it like um, it just is you're you've got the the player's best interest at heart really so is this happening is this happening more and more from your experience and I'll get and your perspective on this from a player but is this happening more and more that players are looking external not only in rehab and that's obviously the topic of this conversation but just general performance related issues and you know development yeah definitely like it's it's a really interesting one so I've actually I've got somebody coming in next week from a premiership club who's undergone a massive rehab and he's coming in for the week um to top up on what Ant was saying before all things speed evasion um maybe even confidence in there as well um, and yes, it definitely is growing. Like the more I run my business, the more contact I've got with players. Interestingly, I think the clubs are becoming way more open um, to, to, to having somebody like myself involved with their process. Maybe not necessarily just dropping the entire thing on my head, but involving me and in getting my eye and my opinions on certain scenarios and players' injuries, etc. And I think that comes down to, I think, in general, there's a few there's a few practitioners out there in the in the sports performance world at the moment who are just doing a brilliant job of of upscale upselling and, and and educating the the kind of performance world around speed and agility. Speedworks being one, Les being another, all the information that Ken Clark and JB are spitting out. And people are starting to realize actually, do you know what move movement does genuinely matter? It's not just about this isolated strength development of the knee or the ankle it's so much more integrated than that and actually um clubs are starting to cotton on to that and i think the door is starting to open um a lot more these days um and hopefully we'll continue to do so when it comes to rehab with with top players and clubs which is which is brilliant and the other side to it as well is the cpd that comes alongside that like a, a lot of clubs are always interested in trying to okay what do you think in this scenario or this case um, come in, do your thing, but we'd like our coaches and our staff to be a part of that so they can see the process. We can understand what's going on. We can try and upskill um, and, and kind of round out the performance department in general. So it's it's definitely something that's on the rise for sure. That's a savvy way to go about it. Yes, you can come in. Yes, you can work with this player, but so-and-so and so-and-so are going to be with you at the t at particular times so they can learn and we don't have to do this again because they've got your expertise. And it's a, it's a brilliant way to do it because... Like rehab is such a complex topic. My God, it's it, like it's it's absolutely vast in terms of the thought processes, the philosophies, the methodologies, everything that goes into it. And if you've 
got a team of practitioners around you who want to upskill in that area and, and, and bring people back, which is our athletes back, which is just invaluable, then yeah, it makes total sense to get people in and around other practitioners who are um, deemed as experts in and around the speed and change of direction or the evasion space. So it does, it makes total sense. And is it something that you discuss as players on this side of things? Um, not so much, to be honest with you. I mean, I would advocate it to absolutely everyone I could. Um, and it was the first thing I would do to, if I saw someone who played a similar position to me or who valued the same things that I do on the pitch suffer an injury like I had. Um, it would be the first thing that I, that I would recommend. But I think it's part of, a, of probably a bigger picture for athletes now, which is, I think, to have you know a team of people around you outside of the club that you can trust. Um, and that's not to say that, there's, that, that you can't trust people at the club or so on and so forth, but having um, people like Al said, who ultimately solely have your best interest at heart is extremely important as an athlete. And that's not just from a training perspective, but also from, you know, an agent perspective, a finance perspective, a, you know, a soft tissue perspective. I think having all of that taken care of as as individuals who you can trust is extremely important. Um, and I think that, like, like Al said, it's just having Speedworks there is just another avenue for me to explore down as people that I can go to and, and sound check and double check everything to do with strength and conditioning for me and um it's it's like I, I'll, I'll, just, I'll keep talking to the cows come home about how good it's been but it genuinely has been that good um to the point where you know our, I've moved clubs and and I've, I've moved to an entirely different um setup and organization and I'll still programs my weights so you know it's just something that I think when people understand you've got that relationship and understand that um, that they are trustworthy individuals and they too want your best in, that your best interest at heart then you know it can be facilitated for and it can be allowed in a program and it should be because you know rugby you've got forwards who are a completely different makeup to backs and within the backs you've even got guys who are completely different makeups for us to train in the same way is insanity so like our programming my weights just makes perfect sense. He knows me inside out. He he knows the nuances of my injuries, my niggles, what I need at certain periods of the season. It just, for me, it's just a no brainer. I don't want to go into obviously the details contractually, but is in the future, would that be something that you would have those discussions because you feel so, you know, positively about the experiences with a private practitioner that that will be built in to kind of smooth over those potential issues if, the worst did happen? Um, I don't even know if it would be necessary contractually. Okay. It would be something that I would absolutely demand because it's it's that important to me. Um, and again, I just want to highlight, it's nothing to do with the physios or anyone in my places of work. Like the physios that I've got at Leicester, Joe Barton in particular, is amazing. Um, and I would trust him categorically with doing my long-term rehab. If I had to, and let me just clarify that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, if I had an injury, sorry. Um, but in terms of me coming back and being better than I was before, you know, there's no question. Spend doing it with Speedworks would would put me in a better place because of so many different factors. Um, so yeah, it would definitely be something I, I would demand. I guess it's something that people could get quite defensive about. Like, what is it? What is it about me that's wrong? Well, it's actually nothing about you that's wrong. I've just got the incredible trust with this guy. And I suppose from a from your point of view, Al, to make sure that is super, super clear, that the player is okay with you, they're happy with you. However, I've been around him for so long and like Ant said, know him inside out, this is where I fit. I suppose that just that kind of conversation and period of time is super important for the weeks or months that follow. Yeah, one one hundred percent. I actually had a conversation with uh, Al Martin at Bath about this recently. So Al's head of performance at Bath, and he was saying that. So I, I do a consultancy role there, and he was saying that probably a, f a couple of years ago or a few years ago, he wouldn't have been in a place to understand his program well enough to feel comfortable having an external come in and deal with a very very niche topic within the club, or in this case, we're talking about an external rehab. And I think it comes back to 
having a conversation with somebody who's got enough experience and knowledge and know-how to realise, do you know what, sometimes our our players do actually have people on the outside who they trust more so than they do than anybody else that's available. And that actually is just going to strengthen that individual and therefore strengthen the team as well. Um, so yeah, it's it's, it's definitely yeah, some, something that's on the rise and, and really important to kind of think about, I think. I think what Ant just mentioned there as well, about the biggest difference that I see, and this is I used to be a I used to be a rehab coach um at a, at a Premiership club, so I really feel like I know this landscape quite well. Like the difference between rehabbing to come back and rehabbing to come back better than ever. Like there's only a few extra words chucked on the end of that statement, but the difference in being able to do that is absolutely massive. So. Like when you look at the rehab setting and the and, and how it works in clubs, unless you are unbelievably fortunate as a rehab coach, or maybe you're just incredible, who knows? Like you're gonna have quite an extensive list, particularly in rugby union, of people who are gonna be on your rehab sheet. And there's gonna be a lot of people with a lot of different demands. And then you're not only constrained by all of those people and all their demands, you're also constrained probably by the senior team and the first team schedule and you've got to work in and around that schedule and all of a sudden without ever verbalizing it or meaning it to be the rehab becomes a little bit less than potentially what it could be because of those constraints and it's absolutely not the fault of the practitioner who's delivering that rehab it's just the constraints of the environment that are so difficult to navigate around and I think when we talk about private rehab in this process I think that's probably one of the biggest things contextually that people maybe don't understand as much and and I get it because I did it for for a few years at the club and and you understand god I'm doing everything in my power to to deliver a world class program or try and be the best coach I can be but it does however you slice it or dice it if you're coaching six blokes versus coaching one the the dissemination of knowledge and coaching and education and that's a massive one I think education like can you actually upskill the education of the athlete to be to the point where they genuinely understand what it is that they're trying to do so they can evaluate their own performance? That's something that probably maybe gets cut a little bit short, I would say. Um, so, yeah, that uh, uh, hopefully that yeah. adds to the context. Uh, I would say that, that that's the single most... If I could highlight one key difference, it would be the time. And the time is like... is chalk and cheese really and again like Al said this is nothing to do with the quality of people in these organizations it's simply to do with what their expectations are and their workload It's like the physios at the clubs work so hard it's unbelievable and then you've got to add in programming like Al said six different injured blokes being pitch side during training going through HIAs with people and stuff like that it's just crazy so then especially with I will tell you with someone unfortunately like me who's going to be calling you at 10 o'clock at night asking you about something that I've read in a journal or something then every it makes night, your life very every night. <laughs> it makes your life very difficult but even when it gets to like the the actual on feet stuff I know for a fact that you know within a program if you're rehabbing you'll be scheduled to run with a certain period and it's maybe an hour right and you've got an hour to get x amount of stuff done and yeah an hour is a decent amount of time, but is it enough time for you to get out everything you want? No. And me and Al probably spent, I mean, we scheduled in, what were our days? They were like four or five hours probably. And I guarantee you probably one or two were on time. The rest of them were all over time because we wanted to get things right. And there was no pressure from Al having to be somewhere or I having to be somewhere for us to not get it right. So we just stayed out there and we, got what we needed to get out of the session and that was the most important thing for me was that there was no right that's it sorry mate I've got to go somewhere today or sorry mate um you know I've got you've got to jump into this meeting now it was no nah, we'll just we'll hammer it till we get it right and even if you know I've got another client and you're in here I'll keep an eye on you whilst you know it's not going to overlap too much so we always somehow were able to make that work. And for me, that was a massive, massive factor. Probably the most important factor was the time. Um, I'm going to rewind about a minute and a half. I never, ever thought on this podcast 
we would get a player on who said, I read something in a journal. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought that. <laughs> what is going on? Yeah, I've so, got a problem, mate. <laughs> and to, to tell me, what kind of things are you reading? Um, so most recently I did my, uh, I had a small tweak in my quad, in my rec okay. fem. So I read up quite rec a fem, few. stop it now. Yeah. So I read this a bit of much. Pollock, Mendeguccia, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've got serious problems though. Like I will try and find any, anything to help at this point. Yeah. Just, sorry, I should know this and I should have, I should have read up on this and this is naive of me. What's your education background? Mine, sorry. Yeah. Um, nothing in sport. I mean, I went to, okay. I did my A-levels and I'm doing, um, I did a leadership degree at Northumbria. I'm doing a master's at Bath, but nothing in sport, no. Okay. Al, is this, I, I've, I've got zero experience of working in rugby union. So I'm kind of, the football people isn't where my kind of um, benchmark is. But is this relatively normal that a player would do this kind of thing in the rugby union in rugby union, or not? Yeah. No, ants ants are special breed, mate. Um, okay, he, that's why he's uh, here. He, he so shows he, that in a very condescending <laughs> way. <laughs> 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 nah, the, the the truth is, ants probably one of the most driven, conscientious professionals that I have ever worked with, and will do anything and everything in his power to make sure that. He puts himself in the right position to be able to achieve what he wants to achieve. Um, and that might mean reading up in journals, which is which is fantastic. Like he'll send me a quick, quick message saying, Have you read this? What do you think? And then I'll have to scour through papers to try and keep up. Um, but even to, to, to things as having a rigorous recovery protocol that doesn't really get messed with ever. And to have somebody like that working with you makes things super super easy is it common in rugby union it is becoming to be definitely more common um but i wouldn't say that it is it's like just spread evenly throughout the population it's it's not that way but i think what the better athletes do is they take their own welfare far more seriously now that might not be reading journals but it is looking after themselves based on some kind of evidence on somebody that they trust um so yeah, like Ant's definitely up there in terms of his, his desire to upskill his knowledge. And, and it's really, it's great for me as a practitioner because I've never ever worked with anybody who questions me and asks me why as much. Like every single thing that we do is always comes with a why. Like what what's the purpose? Not from a, not from a, I don't trust you, what you're talking about point of view, but a, a very much an inquisitive, I want to understand how this will contribute to me. Um, and and that's that's really really important. So it it, ups, it upskills the practitioner as well. It forces me to be better and bring and bring a better quality of service to the table as well. And just one last thing on this on this point, and we'll dive into the the detail of the injury with with Al. But and the younger guys coming through, do you see a difference with all the things that Alan just mentioned in terms of welfare? Not necessarily reading journals, but being I was just just more conscious about looking after the body in the long term, kind of not only professional health but personal health and things like that. Is that is there a contrast there with you know the younger guys coming through? Um, I think it's probably got a bit better to be fair. Yeah, since I've been been involved, but I still think um, you can see pretty early on the ones who have kind of got it figured out and who haven't. And I think that whether or not you see it in the next two or three years, I think is kind of not the point. I think it's later on that you, you, you'll tend to see like some guys will go like this and other guys, you know, that's what, what I feel like. Um, I say it like I'm a 45 year old vet, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that that's just my opinion is that, you know, it, the earlier you've got it switched on, I think you can make a pretty big um, <clears throat> gap or you can accelerate your, your career at a faster trajectory than someone who hasn't. And that's not to say that you have to live a boring life. I think it's just you have to understand the importance and the impact of some of the stuff that you're doing. And I think that, you know, some examples of guys that I've seen um, who have been on it from the start, I think have had pretty successful careers. Like George Ford, ever since I've known him, has been 
ultra professional. Um, Don't tell know, me you've you... got a journal club. And... <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I might, I might have to set one up with Johnny May though, because he's he's yes. another one who'll be reading that. Um, but George, ever since he was like, since you know, I joined Bath at nineteen, he was always the most professional. Always, you know, doing all the recovery, the ice bath, the stretching, getting his mind right, even when, you know. Uh, you know, for probably my first three, four years, two, three years at Bath, where I was like, "What is this guy doing? Like, has he got a life?" Do you know what I mean? Like, it took it took me a while to understand the importance of that. So, um, yeah, I think that that it is starting the general trend. I think more people are starting to be a bit more professional, but there is still a a pretty big gap between guys who are and who aren't. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Fascinating first half hour. Love it. Right, the injury. Let's get into the bit of a detail. And and I'm gonna keep coming back to you just to give your get your perspective on certain things that Alan's saying. But I'll take us through the kind of key principles, key practices that you're going through upon planning the, the next phase of of uh Ant's rehab when it first happened. Yeah, no worries. Um so the I guess the very first conversation was to sit down and go, okay, well, what what are we actually going to try and achieve? Like, I think that the bare the bare minimum is we're going to regain all the things that S and C coaches and medical staff all know. We're going to regain quad size. We're going to regain knee function. We're going to regain strength and power and jumping ability, etc. But what do you actually want to gain out the back end? We're going to spend six months together, pretty much every day. How do you want to be as a player exiting the process? And I think to have that clarity um, really set the tone for the entire rehab. So um, there was a, there was really the kind of the big goals of, I want to return faster. I want to be as evasive as possible and make sure that on return, I've got a step off my left as well as my right, which historically has been the dominant, dominant side. And then also there's the previous history of having an Achilles rupture, a really nasty Achilles rupture that still had some deficits lying around there from from all those all those years ago. So those were the those were the kind of the big three. And then from that, it was really a case of okay, well, what is it that we need to do to be able to achieve that and and reverse engineer back from those big picture goals? Um and the first one was really having this like speed-based approach. So I know I've been on the podcast before and talked about this speed-based approach, but essentially it's understanding that the high intensity actions of the game sit at the top of your training pyramid. So your max speed, your acceleration, your deceleration, your change of direction or your agility. Um, And identifying early on what physical qualities were responsible for contributing towards developing those. And I know you've had Enda on who speaks unbelievably well around developing things early, like, the second you're off the bed, why aren't you developing your foot strength, your lateral hip strength, your trunk ability, or your trunk's uh, your trunk stability? Um, all those things were chucked into the program almost immediately. Um, in terms of a lot of foot strength as well, targeting not only the ability to run fast and change direction, but also around stability of the shank um, and also contributing towards the injury of previous around that Achilles. Um, so you've you've had... I think recently, Rob, you've had some really cool articles out on on training the foot around first ray, mid foot, four foot, all that stuff. Loads and loads of that until we were blue in the face for the first 10 weeks or so and regaining that kind of that knee function initially. So you had flexion and extension so we could actually get rolling from there. Um, and then after identifying that we're going to have a speed based approach, which means early start and all the speed related qualities and all the things that are responsible for being able to run fast. Um, was almost looking at, okay, well, what are the closed abilities you need to be able to have a wicked step? Well, you need to have unbelievable eccentric qualities around the quad to break yourself. You need to have massive lateral hip stability and you have to have complete control over your trunk, which potentially might have been the reason in the first place that something went awry. We'll never know, but it's it's okay to to, to make some assumptions and, and target those as a bit of a, almost like a prehab to what previously happened. Um, and then the last thing, and this was the big thing for me, I actually think in an ACL rehab, as long as the surgery is good, 
And as long as the athlete, like we've spoken about, is diligent around recovery and puts themselves in a position to make sure they've got a quiet knee that's not effused and we're not chasing our tail with a knee that's like puffy and sore, but we're training on it anyway because it's week 10 and, and the literature says we should be doing that, um, was this idea of like skill acquisition. And this was by far and away the funnest part of the rehab. Like it was, it was so enjoyable. Like once we got back strength, once we back, got back reactivity, once we got back decent levels of speed and repeatability, the challenge to me was really like, okay, well, what does AMP do on a pitch? What does he do continuously or repetitively from a skill point of view? And what are the scenarios that I can build him up to to feel absolutely confident going in to training on day one, not to just kind of survive through training on day one, but just to get the ball in his hands and absolutely thrive and tear up on day one. And that idea of skill acquisition and gradually going from close to open, simple to complex, simple to really challenging was was just a it was an absolute joy to go through. And um I mean, I've actually I've got <laughs> I've got a good story about this. So I've got a I've got a young lad, uh Luca, his name is. He's an he's an intern at Speedworks. He was an athlete and he's a he's the best lad ever. He wants to become a coach. And he he took a real interest in the speed stuff. So I so I took him on as an intern and kind of coached him up and, and gave him some education. Anyway, he trained with Ant so vigorously that so he was Ant's training partner towards the latter parts of the rehab. And uh, he was doing some of his training on the side. Anyway, he got so bloody good, we sent him off to GB Bobsled for a trial. And he got in. So now he's traveling all over Europe and I've lost my intern. <laughs> <laughs> class how good's that wants yeah. to be a coach ended up becoming an athlete yeah yeah class good um good so yeah so as a as a big picture um kind of summary that was how we had three we had three processes the goal was to come back faster more evasive than ever um and more confident than ever and the three processes were let's employ a speed-based approach that means we're not going to spend ages running plodding around a pitch to try and get our meters up everything that we do is going to be drill orientated to start with then we're going to dribble and scissor and we're going to bound and we're going to do our plyometrics to bridge the gap and then we're actually going to run fast repeatedly and that was what i think one of the the big things that i was happiest with was that at month i actually wrote down a couple of couple of notes and timelines at month five and a half and pb does lifetime speed um at 10.4 meters per second. And I thought that was just a really, not, it's not the be all and end all, of course, but it's a really nice nod to the process of of employing this ability to, we're going to get our shapes right. We're going to get our postures right. We're going to get our rhythms right. We're going to gradually progress our intensities and our volumes, just like a sprinter would, until we can run really, really fast repetitively before we then worry about taking that speed and putting it into game speed um so yeah that was a that was that was a really really nice moment within the within the rehab i don't know Ant, if you want to to jump in i can give you a timeline rob if you'd like of all the different things that happened at all the different periods of time i know snc's would probably appreciate that one we'll do that in a second i've just got a quick question for Ant. with this with this approach i don't i don't know what your preconceptions of an acl rehab were i guess they were slightly different because you'd worked with al before but was there any points during those months of working with Al that you were maybe concerned that you were moving too quick because of the oh. preconception? Okay. Cool. Yeah, no, no, no. I was, I mean, there's probably only one time that can spring to mind and it's probably the first time that I actually went to see him after my thing and like, bear in mind, I hadn't done any, barely any movement yet. Um, and there was no reason why I couldn't, but. I think we did some really low level dribbling on in the in the car park I think it was and I remember at that point I was thinking my knee is going to blow up tomorrow but it was completely fine and I think literally from that moment on I was like yeah we're sweet here I know this is and there was actually another time where I slipped but that wasn't no. anything to do with that I slipped and we panicked <laughs> <laughs> that it was, was completely fine. I literally got up and finished the, the session. Timeline, that was week twelve. That was the that was one of the first time we did any banded D cells, and Ant managed to lose his footing and rolled over the top of his left knee, which was his ACL side. And then, honestly, I've got a video. The mechanism was exactly the opposite <laughs> thing that you would ever want to see as a rehab coach see your athlete do. Anyway, he got up, and thank God he stayed up because I was just like, oh no. <laughs> Difficult conversation with the club. Yeah, it could have been, yeah. 
the interesting <laughs> one about that hand could have been. so like coming in for your first session and dribbling like on your feet dri- dribbling for people that don't know is just like doing low level running mechanics um we did it over ankle we actually ended up progressing to over shin in that very first session um was you had great function in the knee it was really quiet you had good lateral hip strength and ability to hip lock uh, in closed drills you had great ability to actually stay stiff on drop landings and be able to bounce moderately off your off that left side so all those things combined equate to the ability to dribble it's just an isolated you're doing it in isolation not an integration in terms of actually doing the speed mechanics so that was the that was the reason you can do all the things that suggest you should be absolutely fine to dribble so do you know what we're going to try it and we're going to do it at low level and low volumes to begin with and we're going to assess <laughs> and see <laughs> assess and see what happens the next day and make sure that kind of you're in no pain you don't have any response you don't we call it technical threshold but basically you don't look terrible when you do it and the answer to all those was a tick box like it was a yes and and that set the tone for being able to understand right okay you can get on your feet there's no reason why we can't continue but our 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 strength is still going to be the priority that's going to be number one but there's absolutely no reason why we can't start ingraining the motor patterns that i know in four months time we're going to need to have super sharp and super conditioned for you to run really, really fast. Right. Go through that timeline with for us. I know the S&C coaches and physios will want to hear that timeline. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be written down, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, so Ant came in to me after six to seven weeks at the club. Um, so just restoring the usual stuff, re- restoring joint function, going through some basic movement patterns once he was able to tolerate it, squatting, hinging, lunging, all that kind of stuff. Um, so when he came in to me, the initial assessment was, okay, let me see what's going on at the hip. Like I want to see if there's this big lateral hip shift going on, which is a really common thing for things to, to disappear on ACL rehab. So immediately at week eight, we had that just flooded into the program in terms of isolated lateral hip work, um, but also more integrated hip lock type work, which is basically just an extension flexion pattern of the pelvis um, with lateral leans and various variations. And they just progress consistently all the way through the program. Um, like Ant said, uh, we had dribbles uh, in there from the get-go. So that was week eight, low level, uh, but that was preceding being able to bounce quietly on one on his, on his ACL side, on his left side, um, and being able to showcase a, a ability to stay stiff on drop landings um, and also being able to long lever hip bridge for 15 to 20 seconds with no issues in a kind of co-contracted state. So that means with a, a toe against a box, if the heel's slightly off um, and being able to engage the ankle, the knee and the hip in this hip, long lever hip extension. Um, we also immediately brought in lateral drills. So if you can dribble and you can bend your knee, and your lateral hip is fairly strong, there's no reason why you can't start doing actual lateral drills. So we were out there, and I believe it was January, it was cold. We were out there in, a, in, in frosty mornings pulling sleds sideways, um, like try, trying to emulate the patterns that we wanted. And initially, like you could see the trunk strength, the levels of trunk strength are actually significantly quite down. There was a lot of, we call it overspill, but in reality, overspill is just like a lateral lean in the direction that you are, or in the opposite direction of travel. Um, so obviously that trunk sway is not what we want to see. Um, and then we had, uh, and then we were introducing shuffles, etc., on that session as well. So banded shuffles, being able to sit into a low position where you could move laterally and push hard. And every time that I felt technically he was on the money, we just progressed. We had this idea of just test progress. And the test wasn't anything to do with force plates or data. The majority of the time, the test was, do you move within what I consider to be my bandwidth of acceptability within a technical model? And then we would progress on. So that took us to week week eight. Week 10, we introduced the 1030 protocol. So the 1030 protocol is a dribble protocol, um, 10 reps of 30 meters. There's a timed 10 meter section at the end. And... I want to see that progressively get faster within session and over at least two or three sessions. So consecutively while we're, while we're doing that. 
And initially what we saw was a couple of times would be three seconds, another couple of times would be two and a half seconds, et cetera, et cetera, and then they go back up and there'd be these fluctuations in, in ability to cover that 10 meter time, uh, 10 meter zone, sorry. Um, and until that was stable, and until that was consistently coming down and down and down, up to about our, again, our speed-based conditioning model kind of goes to extensive dribbles at about 60% of your ability. So until Amp was able to dribble through that 10 meter segment at six meters per second, I was like, we're going to hold there until you can tolerate it. And I want to be able to see all the things that we know we want to be able to see. Stiff stance leg, good stance leg retraction, similar ground times and air times, all the things that we've spoken about before. Um, and then that took us on uh, to, so this is moving towards week 12. We had sled accelerations in the program for the first time. Um, and we had Axel Decel uh, stuff in there as well. So really interestingly, I had, um, I had a biomech intern uh, called Craig working alongside us. And Craig was absolutely fantastic. He's moved to Exeter City Football Club now, but he was brilliant. He, I would send him videos of slow-mo of Ant running and he would put this software on top of it and he would spit us out these graphs of thigh angular velocity and all the different kinematics. And what we saw, it was, it was honestly, it was class. And what we saw was in early, the early days of acceleration, so weeks 12 to 14, weeks 10 to 12 to 14, there was a bias of Ant to having this, we caught it without getting into too much detail, um, a really flexion dominant based acceleration pattern. So instead of pushing behind his body to push his hips forward, he would sack that strategy off and would actually just throw his left leg at the target and throw his right leg at the target, creating this really flexion orientated pattern. So do you remember that? Ant? Like there was a lot of conversation about how you have to push to punch and not just throw your leg at the target to get yourself moving forwards. And yeah, no, hundred percent. It felt um, very, it felt very alien at the time. It felt like I was running normally, but I wasn't. Yeah, and and not only was the data supporting what we were seeing, and I could show that to Ant and show him exactly just how flexion based he was, but actually by integrating in sled heavy sled pulls into his into his training, which some people may consider to be quite aggressive that early, actually what we're encouraging is. Not only technically does a sled at that weight put you in the right positions, it forces you to produce force with a more extension bias pattern. You have to push your leg behind you because if you don't, your chest will be lifted up and you'll be pulled backwards. So it was a really nice way of trying to fix that pattern without too much over coaching, which was a which was a really, really nice, nice way to go about doing it. Um and then at week 12, we'd started to already introduce uh, change of direction drills. So really closed in nature, some close quarters, some more expansive in terms of the degree of cut. Um, and we kind of continued those through uh, to week 14 where he continued his dribble conditioning. So dribble conditioning, 50 meters up to 100 meters of just dribble running, smooth tempo, kinematic analysis to understand ground contact times and air times, stride lengths and frequencies trying to understand the balance and smoothness of his running. Um, and clearly there were some deficiencies there. There was, what I've started to find is, is there are two different types of, of athlete when they do their ACL. Um, you've got the one who's an incredibly good solution finder. So they're running and their ground contact times are actually very, very similar. So regardless of the injury, right contact time is X, left contact time is X but the displacement generated off that injured side actually shortens up considerably because he can't produce the same force in that short time frame. Or you end up, and that was Ant's profile, or you end up the other way. You end up spending too much time on the ground because you're inhibited and you've, you need the, the necessary time to be able to try and push yourself forwards. And you end up with this very vertical oscillation pattern where everything's bobbing up and down so it looks like one one step is taking you forwards and across and then one step is taking you vertically up and not traveling as far um and fit the and fit the profile of shorter contacts but um not not as much displacement so there was a lot of cueing around trying to push the hips forward and putting cones down on the floor to 
commit to generating a little bit more hip displacement. Um, and then by that point, I mean, we were doing that three times a week and moving upwards of 70, 75%. We'd fluctuate um, surfaces. We'd go on the track, which was just a brilliant surface to try and encourage a little bit more elasticity that maybe um, the limb didn't have yet. Um, and then we do it on the grass as well in the middle of the week. And then at week 16, uh, we moved towards uh, more dribble bleeds, um, more extensive tempo type work. So for clarity, before anybody shoots me, our extensive tempo work is more 100 meters, 16 to 18 to 20 seconds, depending on who you are. It's going to be operating in and around the 70 to 72, 75%, again, depending on who you are, um, of speed, of max speed. And we had wickets in there as well, which were just like this wonderful tool to help Ant be able to recover his limb a little tighter. So when you've done your ACL, there's a real tendency to let that shin open out too early and not keep a really nice tight knee flexion pattern as, it, as, your, as your swing leg travels underneath your bum. Um, so the wickets forced him to do that because he had to pick his leg up a little quicker and a little tighter. Um, and by this point, we're, we're getting into pretty closed an aggressive change of direction. Now, some people would call it agility because Ant's making decisions based on visual cues, but usually based on me. But the decisions allowed or the, the outcomes are really limited to one or two different options. So it is agility in that he's perceiving me and moving, but really it's pretty closed in reality. Um, and then once we, got into, once we got into week 16, week 18, we're starting to time the axles and the D-cells, and we used Damien Harper's research to have a look at D-cell ratios, which was another really, really important one. Um, and there was a reason we we went for the timed axles later, or I went for the timed axles later. When you're dealing with somebody like Ant, it doesn't matter if he's got one leg or two healthy legs, like he expects to beat himself every single time he goes to try and do anything. Um, it's just the way he's hardwired. He's incredibly competitive with himself and he gets pissed off if he doesn't. So I made the conscious decision to start to move the timed work slightly later in the process until I knew that he was able to start to actually compete with himself. Um, so that was that was quite an important mark. Can I just jump in, Al? Yeah, yeah. Can I just jump in super quick? And how important was it for you to have some numbers, to have some data, to have just some times just to keep you, I suppose, yourself in check? that things are going the way you want them to go. Yeah, it was huge. Um, yeah, I mean, I wanted everything I could measure, to be honest with you. And we, I mean, we used pretty much every gadget that was out there to measure everything. Like we had the free lap doing my speeds. We had the GPS with Stat Sports doing that. Um, you know, that was all, I think they sent an iPad out for Al as well so that he could check it whilst we were on and adjust the session accordingly. We even used Whoop, you know, I'm wearing their shirt for recovery stuff. Like, I would adjust sessions accordingly, which was massively important. So, you know, that type of stuff was was huge for me. Even seeing my heart rate go down as we went on, you know, like I was talking about the extensive conditioning. As I got more adjusted to it, my heart rate would be less during the same session. That's when we knew we had to push on with it. So seeing all those, like, objective markers get ticked off and improve week on week, was massive um, and really, really important. And, you know, we, we structured a lot of our program according to data, which is funny because like we're talking about how much of this process was very much like feel and knowledge and, you know, until we get it right. But there was a lot of data involved as well. Um, you know, like Al, by the end of it, we we came to the conclusion that pretty much after every three weeks, give or take, I needed four days off and I'd come back and my scores would be miles better on the Monday as a result of it. And that was through looking through all these numbers and all this stuff that we had. Um, so for me as an athlete, having not only having the data available to me to see that I'm improving, but having someone who understands the data and is not afraid to adjust sessions accordingly was massive. Great insights. Thanks, mate. Um, Al, take us through those next few been um through time scale two timelines yeah, and then we've got one more big question for you before yeah, no I let worries. you both go. The, um, so yeah so we got up to so we're, we're kind of doing we're doing agility not agility uh at week 16 18 
And then by week 20, like we are have atting it at flying sprints. Now that started it, that started at flying tens from, and this, I think this is where an understanding of speed is really, really important and understanding that not all speed is equal. Like speed isn't just running as fast as you can. That's what people think it is, but it comes in so many different forms. So if you start from a standing start, the inertia that you need to break is so energy consuming that by the time you get to 30 to 40 meters as a team sport athlete, that's incredibly challenging. Uh, whereas if you do it from a rolling start or you do it after the end of a dribble bleed and inertia didn't need to be broken because you've rolled into your running, then all of a sudden the energy demands of that sprint are significantly, significantly less. And the same thing, once you start timing it, the stress of that moment goes up and the, the intensity of what you're doing goes up and then finally once you start competing against somebody and technically things start to go out the window a little bit because you will just do anything in your power to win that race well then the actual stress from a muscular perspective and tissue perspective becomes higher because you're not adhering to the very strict efficiency bandwidths that we've been training for the previous eight to ten weeks so understanding that when I say sprinting it's a very progressive pathway of starting from dribble bleeds to rolling higher speed runs to rolling sprints to static sprints to time sprints to competitive sprints all over the course of six to eight weeks and it's that that I think is is sometimes missed and um, that's that's really important and then once we get to once we get up to weeks 20 to 22 ish um, this is when the evasion work really kicked in like a lot. So three times a week with an opponent who was not me, who's a terrible defender, um, actually having somebody who was able to defend properly, uh, who was just as fast as Anthony was, was absolutely critical. So we, we started in closer quarters, um, kind of 10 by 10 meter squares and we'd replicate different scenarios that Ant would have to, to go through. It could be something as simple as somebody was covering across and he had to step in off his left. The next layer would be, for example, turning around and not knowing what the situation was going to be and reacting based on the defender. Then there'd be two defenders. The drills started to get more expansive out of 15 to 20 meters wide. So the speeds increased um, and being able to tolerate that change of direction at higher speeds up with, up, up with and beyond of seven, eight meters per second and the stresses that happen within the knee and the tissue and the system um, was really progressive all the way through those kind of weeks of 20, 21, 22, 23. And then by week 24, um, or weeks 23 and 24, we started to bring in this thing called Game Sim. Um, and Game Sim uh, was kind of co-created by myself and, and Tom Tomlinson from, from England Rugby. Uh, so TT's a, a good friend of mine and, and somebody I look up to a lot. He's incredibly knowledgeable. Um, and he provided me with all the worst case scenario data, not only for a back in England, but specifically for Anthony in England. And we designed sessions based around that um, and gradually progressed the intensity and the volume tolerance to match what was going to happen um, potentially in an, in an England camp as a worst case scenario. Um, so all of that was, was really a seven month process to get to the point of where you could integrate back in. And those are kind of the timelines. And there's obviously a lot of, a lot of physical tests that are, are, are kind of benchmarks that existed within there. Um, that I don't know if you, you, you want to talk about, but they are, they're always a, they're always a bone of contention. What are people using and how are they telling us things? Yeah, that's that's one other thing Al, that we forgot to to mention is is the importance of having someone else there, not myself and an hour. And it was Luca in our case because Luca was just as I don't know why, but Luca was just as committed to the cause as we were, and that he would sit out there and and tell and give me feedback on how things were looking and feeling for him as a defender. And I think that that's really overlooked in in a rehab process is me beating Al one on one. Like Al probably can't give me the necessary feedback beyond how it looks to how it should feel as, as a defender in rugby, whereas Luca can. And Luca was able to, to give me that feedback, but also he didn't have the constraints on him like it would be if I asked another athlete who had training tomorrow or you know someone who um, had just finished a session because you know those guys need to get in and recover. 
So having him there and able to do that made the whole process significantly better as well. So it's not just the constraints of physio availability and time, but it's also having someone else there who, who doesn't have those constraints as well because he played a significant role in the rehab process as well. I'm really conscious of time for, for both of you for, uh, to, to be able to get on with your evenings, but I'm going to probably ask a big question and I'm going to ask you to keep it relatively brief, but I'm going to come to you first, Al. Biggest obstacle that you faced during them six months that you were working together? Can you let us know what that is? That anything come to mind? You know what? Probably as a rehab coach, I haven't, I think often you get so emotionally attached to the cause that it's it's often quite easy to make decisions that if you were incredibly objective about it, maybe you wouldn't. Um, I think there are the biggest obstacle we faced were around understanding timelines and readiness now, and quite rightly wants to push and push and push to get back into playing the game that he's paid to play. Um, and trying to manage that as best as possible from a relationship with understanding him, understanding the data, understanding um, the demands of whatever game it is that he's going to go back into, and then managing that transition with the club is actually something that's that's maybe overlooked. I think that potentially was our biggest obstacle. The rehab itself went without a single hiccup. It, it, there were no obstacles there at all. Um, but the transition back into the club is and managing expectations and having a an op, an open and honest enough relationship to genuinely sit down and go look i know you had your eyes set on this game this week but actually we don't think you've got quite enough load or we think you do to be able to go we're actually going to target this week instead and i'm not saying it because i want to delay your rehab i'm saying it because i think it's for your best interest and having the mindfulness and the maturity and the objectivity as a rehab coach that is absolutely critical and I think when you're I think that's easier for an external practitioner um, and potentially can sometimes become quite difficult in club uh, because there are certain politics involved in getting players back so yeah that was probably the biggest one interesting Al and same question to you from your perspective yeah, I would say the return to play bit was the most difficult, the, the biggest obstacle was just because I felt like I had pretty much ticked every box in myself of how I needed to feel to in order to play. But there was certain criteria that was separate to what we had um, as an idea that we needed to get back to for me to play that they had. And it was just managing that last bit, which was the most difficult because I'm so close to playing and all I want to do is play. Um, so that was the toughest bit. And then, um, I injured my calf anyway in the week I was supposed to play. So <laughs> it was meant to be, I wasn't meant to play. Um, but yeah, that was, that was rough. Um, you know, I felt, I probably felt I could play, could have played a couple of weeks before that. Um, and I'd been waiting at that time. It was probably seven and a half, eight months to play. So I was itching. Um, so to, for it to be delayed, two weeks at that time felt like the world was caving in on me but turned out being a lot longer than that anyway just as a final point to, to see us on our way the, the feeling of being back in full training that first time going from the dark two days when you're eating eating burgers eating whatever you want to being on your own not speaking to the missus that psychological state to that first full training session back Give us an insight into the how, what that looked like, felt like even. Um, I mean, I'll be honest with you. The first training session back is not the time where I'm like, uh, that's not where I feel like I'm, it's it, you know, it's, I'm over it, you know. The time where I felt like, like, you know, back to complete square one and, and normal again and uh, this is me is when I'm playing and training well. And that took me until this season really because of a whole bunch of variables and niggles and stuff like that. So I'd probably say until maybe two and a half, three months ago, um, or maybe you could argue in the start of pre-season, but there was no games where I felt really like I've got my 
you know, I, I, I've been paid my rewards, I guess, for all the hard work. That's when I felt it, not when I first set foot on the training pitch, because you've got to earn it all again. You know, it's not, you know, just because you, you've done it, your ACL and, and this and that, you've got to go back and, and show that you're the same player you were before. It's irrelevant that your times are great and this and that. You still have to be a player at the end of the day and you still have to show people that you're the better player than you were before. So until that was done, I wasn't, I wasn't happy. I think that's a perfect way to uh, to finish off. But I suppose that pretty sums up some of the mentality info that, that Alan had gave us about working with you. So I really appreciate your insights. But Alan, thank you very much for coming on again. Really appreciate it. Pleasure. And obviously, Anne, thank you for giving up some time, some valuable evenings, uh, evening time to, uh, to chat to us and giving us your perspective. So I really appreciate it. And uh, look forward to keeping in touch and, and speaking to you both soon. Thanks, Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. Cheers, guys.